All right, uh, welcome everybody to the session today. Uh, thanks for joining. Uh, today we're going to have a, an interesting conversation with a couple two people that I, I get couple two couple two tree people that I really respect in this world, uh, people that I've known for a little bit of time, and should be a great conversation. Um, and we're going to talk about uh, the definitive guide to cockroach DVD, a, a book that just came out, and I believe we're giving away a copy to uh, a bunch of people that attended this session today. So stick with us and. Um, you get a free book out of the whole deal and enjoy a great conversation. But today is is kind of a beginner. We're going to talk a little bit about kind of distributed databases, uh, distributed systems, a little bit on the history of the database market, kind of how we got to where we're at and what the future needs to be uh, in terms of all these things. And then a little bit in the art of kind of what does it take to actually write a book? Um, but we, we would love questions from the audience along the way, uh, anything and everything here. Um, you know, our, our panel of guests here are, are pretty well versed in databases. Uh, collectively, across all three of us, I guess, there's probably a couple couple decades here of, of knowledge. So um, we're happy to take questions along the way. And, and before anybody asks, yes, absolutely, the, the recording for this will absolutely be available later today. I know we, uh, you know, we, 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 we host these things on Zoom, but I know we're also streaming to YouTube and I sometimes to LinkedIn, but I know we're, we're streaming to our YouTube channel, which allows us to get this up on YouTube very quickly. So um, with that, I am going to actually come on camera and I'm going to ask my 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 two guests here, our, our great panelists, Guy and Ben, to come on camera too. So um, today we are going to talk about uh, the definitive guide to CockroachDB, which is uh, probably the most recent O'Reilly book to be published. I don't know. It was only, it's only like a month old. Maybe they published another one. Um, but before we even get started, I got to tell you, I got to give all the thanks to O'Reilly for giving us actually a cockroach on the cover of the, co the, the book, because it had been really strange if we didn't get a cockroach on the cover of this book, you guys. I, I don't I don't know. Um, but I want to introduce uh, Ben Darnell and Guy Harrison. Uh, they are two of the authors of the book itself. There was a there was a third person involved, uh, Jesse Seldes, who's who leads up uh, the documentation team at Cockroach, who, is also a, a tremendous writer in his, in his own right. Um, but today we have Ben and Guy with us. So Ben and Guy, welcome. I guess, good morning, Guy. Oh, I can't hear you, buddy. You're on mute. Um, my apologies. Um, yep, hi, I'm, I'm from Melbourne, Australia. Um, it's Australian cockroach as well on the book. I don't know it if is. you knew that, but yeah. That's good. I, I, I like the detail, Guy, so we're already getting there. And then uh, welcome, Ben, as well. Where, where are you? Where are you, Ben? I'm in Brooklyn. That's right. Beautiful Brooklyn. We're my, my second home, I guess. So, all right, guys. Well, uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, let me just actually bring up my notes so that I am in a good spot here, guys. Uh, let's see here. Okay, great. Um, so just to start the whole session, um, you know, you are a couple of the two authors on this book. I would love to learn a little bit more about each of you. Ben, I know you pretty well after three and a half years of working with you for your company. Um, but do you want to just kick it off kind of a little bit of yourself and a little bit of history? Sure. So my background, um, I've been working in the uh, in the tech industry for uh, uh, 20, uh, 20 years now, just uh, just hit the uh, hit the 20 year mark since I started working at, uh, at Google um, at the, to start my career. Um, uh, and at Google, um, I worked on uh, a number of things, including uh, database abstraction layers was uh, was my first project with uh, with Spencer Kimball, who would go on to be uh, co-founder here at uh, Cockroach Labs. And uh, and then I also worked on on Google Reader um, for uh, for several years. So that was my uh, my most prominent uh, project there at Google. And then after uh, after I left Google, I uh, went to uh, I've been at a number of startups, um, uh, most notably uh, Dropbox and Square, um, and uh, got a lot of experience with uh, with different kinds of uh, of database uh, technologies along the way at all these different uh, all these different startups that uh, that uh, came to uh, to inform uh, the approach that we ended up taking. Uh, here at uh, Cockroach Labs. Well, God bless you, and I miss Google Reader, Ben. And there's a lot of people. Who Me do. too. Absolutely. A lot of people. I'm telling you, it's one of those yep. beloved things that, like, why? I don't, you know, the, mm. you know, it's sometimes Google does weird things with great products. So it was great, Ben. So there you go. I think a lot of people will agree. You probably hear that a lot, though. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. So it's always something uh, something people uh, people uh, people bring up, and yeah, it's uh, it's a very uh, very sorely missed product. So thank you. Yeah. That's okay. It's these things happen. So, um, and then guy, I met you probably for the first time about, I don't know, like 10 or 12 years ago, I was working in the Hadoop space, but, um, you've been around and involved in databases really for quite some time as well. Yeah. 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 I'm, I'm sorry to have to say it'll, it's coming up to almost 40 years now. Um, yeah. I started working in the industry in 1984. 
Um, so that's a while ago. Um, when I came in, um, the relational database was just um, gathering steam. Um, I worked with a couple of pre-relational technologies. Um, but uh, in the mid-80s, mid I started working with Oracle technology and um, worked pretty strongly with that, wrote a few books about Oracle in the 90s, um, worked um, with MySQL and, and wrote a book on that. Um, and then I became... Um, uh, the VP of engineering at a uh, reasonably large database tools company called Quest Software. If any of you guys remember the Toad, yep. um, we were the Toad company. Um, and in that role, I was responsible for sort of keeping tabs on all the different database technologies that were around, which is a great job for me because I just love sort of like learning the new stuff. And around about 2010, you know, the relational database seemed to be running out of steam, but a bunch of new technologies like Hadoop, um, Cassandra, MongoDB emerged. Um, so I got, you know, I got involved in them. Um, to, these days, I um, I work as a CTO for a small database um, blockchain technology company called Proven DB. Um, but I I keep I keep my tabs on um, on the various database technologies. I write a monthly column for database trends and applications. And of course, last year I was um, lucky enough to collaborate on the book. Yeah, and then Guy, you know, I. I like you, I'm all, I'm coming up on the 40 year thing too. I think I graduated from, and I, my undergraduate, oh man, it's 92, I think as I graduate. So I'm actually at the 40 years. So I'm close to, I'm getting closer, 30 or whatever it is. It's a long time. <laughs> it's <I'm> 30. Like, <laughs> it's, I can't even do the math anymore. It's getting to be big numbers. Um, the uh, guy, you also have been kind of interested in distributed databases for quite some time as well. Yeah. I mean, it's, uh, you, you wrote another book about distributed systems and distributed database, what, two years ago, something like that? Uh, the, the, yeah, 2015, I wrote a book um, called Next Generation Database, That's which right. was kind of about the sort of like the latest wave of technologies that um, we alluded to before, Hadoop, Cassandra was in there, a few databases that don't exist anymore, like React, but it was essentially... Um, the sort of like the, the, the dual revolutions that, w that we used to call big data and no SQL, yep. you know, the, the relational database kind of like failed to support the globally distributed always on applications um, that people were building. And so they were looking for alternatives. And at the time, those were the alternatives that, you know, you, you had to pick one of these sort of not quite right systems. Um, <laughs> of course, that's, I'm leading into, of course, that today we, we're lucky enough to have um, distributed SQL databases like Cockroach DB, yeah. which um, really allow us to make no compromises. Well, I'm an old relational person as well, and I never really understood NoSQL, honestly, the whole concept. I think I gave up on the document model somewhere around XML. I just didn't get it. I, I, I need relationships. I think of yeah. normalization, you know, like. I, I think that's fair enough. But if you're a, if you're a, um, a, a young developer or a, or a modern full stack developer working yeah. with JavaScript, um, it's it's kind of very handy just to be able to say I've got this JavaScript object. I'm just going to dump it into something like MongoDB. Yeah, and you know you can get started and move quickly that way. Um, the problem is is that at some point you're going to say, and I'm going to need a consistent transaction, or I'm going to have to write some sort of complex logic to join or reconcile data, and you'll have to do it all in you know hundreds of lines of JavaScript code where yeah. you know one SQL um, join with a group by could do the same thing. So, um, but it is understandable. And that's why, you know, modern databases do have JSON types. So if you do want that experience of just dumping your JSON object into a database, you can still do that. Yeah. Um, and, and it's an important feature of, of Postgres style databases that include Cockroach DB. Yeah. And I, you know, I agree. It just, I guess I'm coming from the inverse of the, the, the newly minted programmer, honestly, guy, I'm coming from the old world to the new. But I think when you're coming from, you know, that world into this, you start to realize, wait a second, the relational database provides a lot of power, you know, I mean, to, to not have to codify referential integrity or to, you know, uh, you know, pull together data in an aggregate, aggregate view and let the database just do that for you, as opposed to actually coding that sort of thing. I, you know, it's interesting. I, you know, it, we get a lot of questions about like what workloads are right for NoSQL versus distributed and all these sort of things. It's a, it's an interesting question, right? So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, Ben, back to you. Uh, so, you are co founder and chief architect of Cockroach Labs. And now, what year did Cockroach start? It was 2015, correct? Or 16? What time did it, the company started a year after the, the repo, right? Right. So, we started as, a, as an open source project in 2014 and then founded right. the company in 2015. 
Right. And really, what was kind of the, the genesis of starting this whole thing? I'm sorry, but Ben, it's a bold step to start a database company. Um, there's big, big, huge database companies and there's, you know, there's some great databases. So what, what kicked this all off with the three of you? So the, the idea for Cockroach, uh, Cockroach DB actually goes back a few years, uh, a few years further. Um, to about uh, 2012, when uh, Spencer and Peter and I were actually at uh, doing another startup together uh, called Viewfinder. We were building a, building a photo sharing app um, that you haven't heard of, um, except in the context of uh, a backstory of CockroachDB. Um, but uh, but we uh, we were looking at uh, looking at the database options. All three of us had uh, had been at uh, had been at Google, um, and uh, and so we liked the kind of uh, automatic scalability that we got with uh, we got with Google's tools, and we were looking at uh, looking at the alternatives that uh, that existed out there in the out in the real world, and uh, and everything seemed to be kind of lacking. Um, like I, I had had experience with um, with uh, Bigtable with uh, with uh, Google Reader, and uh, and saw that it was uh, it was really nice for um, in terms of scalability and automatic management, but it had a lot of uh, a lot of limitations, uh, especially around the lack of indexes. And yep. to have good uh, good index support, you really need uh, transactions or something close to transactions. And so I I had built something that uh, you know a pseudo transactional layer to update uh, update indexes by hand. And that was the kind of thing you needed to do when you're using um, a big table type system, um, including its uh, you know counterparts like uh, like HBase out in the open source world. Um, and so that uh, that led to the uh, to the realization that uh, you, you know we really need a uh, a transactional core for the for the product. If you don't have transactions, then everything else gets uh, gets a lot more complicated. And so um, that led uh, Spencer to uh, to really uh, think about uh, you know designing a distributed uh, distributed transactional uh, database. And uh, of course, we were in the middle of building this photo sharing app startup, and uh, and uh, we, we decided that, that well, we can't do this right now. It would be a distraction from building the uh, the next hot new uh, photo sharing uh, photo sharing application. Um, and of course, uh, you, you know, we've seen how that how that turned out. Uh, no one's heard of Viewfinder. Everyone's heard of uh, Instagram and uh, and all the others. So um, it turns out we didn't need a massively scalable database for our photo sharing app. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. But then um, in 2014, we were uh, we found ourselves at Square after they had acquired the uh, the, the uh, company that was building the photo sharing app to uh, to staff up their uh, their New York engineering office, and we saw once again that uh, Square was using uh, sharded MySQL as their main uh, as their main database, and this was uh, this was causing um, you, you know a lot of pain for them because they uh, they're in the business of course of moving money around they're a you know a payments company and so. Um, whenever any inconsistencies could creep into the data because of sharding or asynchronous replication, um, they had all these uh, kind of complicated and ad hoc processes for reconciling uh, reconciling the data and making sure that everything in the end was was correct. And so, um, so we had seen that in the case of both uh, NoSQL databases and uh, manually sharded and asynchronous replicated SQL databases, uh, people have to spend an awful lot of engineering time doing things that the database really ought to be doing for them. And so that's what we set out to build with uh, with CockroachDB is a database that does um, you know does what a database should it keeps your uh, keeps your data um, reliably um, you know on disk distributed across enough uh, enough resources to uh, to be able to survive failures and uh, and uh, keep consistent indexes and things like that and then you can uh, then you can stop worrying about it and you can you, you and your engineers can focus on on building your application solving the problem that you set out to solve and not uh, not building band-aids on top of your on top of your database yeah Ben talk to me about the the, the decision to be guaranteed consistent right to, to implement serializable isolation in this database I mean that had to be a decision early on because there's a lot of engineering acrobatics in this database to ensure that we can do that at global scale, right? And so was that a decision out of the gate or was that something that kind of was spoken about? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think we went through some, some evolution here. Um, you know, I think we did, uh, we, we knew we wanted some level of, uh, of transactions. Yeah. Um, you know, because you, because you need transactions to be able to maintain consistent indexes. Um, so we, we knew that uh, we knew that we needed some kind of transactions. It was not a foregone conclusion that we would be um, only providing serializable isolation. Um, in fact, early versions of CockroachDB provided snapshot isolation as another option. Um, but all of these things are contingent on your uh, on your database architecture. Um, it turns out that in um, in, in a monolithic non-distributed databases, non-distributed database, 
um, that there are things you can do to implement um, read committed and repeatable read isolation levels uh, much more efficiently than serializable. And so that's what uh, that's what uh, MySQL and Postgres and Oracle and all of these uh, all these traditional databases do. Um, and so in these uh, in these databases, there's a big difference in performance between uh, between the lowest isolation level and the highest. Um, right. It turns out that in, uh, in in a distributed system, um, the the parameters kind of change. Um, you can't uh, get, you know there, there aren't as many shortcuts that you can take. Um, and it, it turns out that uh, in the end, our implementation of snapshot isolation, which is a, a, a you know a, a mid level uh, isolation level comparable to repeatable read in terms of the uh, the SQL standard isolation levels that you might be more familiar with. Um, you know, we, we were not able to make um, to, to make a, an implementation of snapshot isolation that was substantially faster than um, than serializability, and it turns out to have significant drawbacks, um, more so than repeatable read in terms of uh, in terms of what you're giving up in consistency. Yeah. And so, our decision to uh, go all in on serializable isolation um, was something that we uh, that we evolved toward. It was uh, it turns out that we could provide. Um, provide serializability um, at very little marginal cost compared to what we could do um, what we could do at, at lower isolation levels to the point that there's no uh, no benefit to yeah. us in operating the offering the lower isolation levels well, and as a result we've uh, we've been able to focus our attention on serializable isolation which is something that tends to get neglected in uh, in most other databases because most applications don't use it and as a result, our uh, isolation level, uh, our, our implementation of serializable isolation is uh, is much more scalable and high high performance than uh, th yeah. than that isolation level in most other databases. Yeah, and and Ben, honestly, like I'm just very happy that that was the decision very early on. I, I just asked in the chat, like, how many people actually know what isolation levels are? Um, just as a general, you know, I maybe nobody will respond because honestly, as a developer, I didn't care. I just used the database and I didn't think about these things. It was like, oh, the DBA was dealing with this like performance tuning thing and they changed the isolation level, but it has ramifications on your application and your data that I don't think everybody knows about. Um, you know, I love the fact that Cockroach is a serializable isolation database. Like we're going to be guaranteed correct because we kind of take that tool out of, we, we take that toy out of the person's hands. You know what I mean? Like, let's just take it out. Let's optimize for that and then tune all the performance underneath to actually get to the point where you can do global transactions at scale. Right. And, and I think, I think that's the trick, right? Yeah. Yeah. You want, your, think, you want your isolation level to, to not give you surprises, right? That's right. Things should be exactly what you expect them to be, even if you don't know what an isolation level is. And yeah. Um, I think, yeah. yeah I, th I think it's really unfortunate that, that, that so many databases uh, default to weaker isolation levels, because when you look at, you know, you look at a textbook definition of uh, of what a transaction is. That's you know, it's it's serializable. It's completely isolated. Yeah. And so, whenever you're using any other isolation level, you're making uh, you're making compromises. Um, and you know, so the transaction is not actually what the uh, what what the you know kind of the textbook definition of transaction is. And so, you're taking a chance that things are going to turn out differently than you expect. And so, I think it's really unfortunate that uh, you know the experience of most people. Most people's uh, interaction with transactions by default is not is not getting that highest level of, of isolation. Yeah, and it's funny, Ben. I don't I don't think people realize. Like, I just always thought that the database was going to have correct data. Like, literally, I had no idea what the I and acid meant. I mean, I think you know people throw around this term acid transactions all the time. Like, oh, we have acid, and I think the trick is the I in acid in in acid, right? And I think there's a whole lot of software engineering that goes into that, and I think it's um. I think it's actually important for people to understand, but hopefully in the, in the future, they won't even have to think about it anyway. We just guarantee, right? So I, I like that. Now, Guy, you've been around databases for a long time as well. You know, we're talking a little bit about isolation levels, some of these things, you know, and in distributed, now we're in this kind of global distributed environment, these sort of things, right? You know, how do we get here? Like you, you've, you too have kind of seen this kind of front row being in databases, right? Like what led us to kind of the getting to this, this point where we are changing the underlying architecture of databases now, these things that are 40, you know, almost 50 years old now, right? Yeah, um, yeah. so I, I think it's it's not hard to see that in the early 2000s, the, the new applications that were coming along, and you can just think Facebook and um, Gmail and whatever sort of like big web 2.0 cloud-based applications that had a global audience and that could not afford any downtime at all. Um, and you try and imagine them running on a, on, on a state-of-the-art relational database of the day, like the latest version of Oracle. And it's immediately apparent that they couldn't. 
Yeah. They just Oracle could not scale to that to that level. Um, nothing could. So when these guys and, and Ben alluded to it before, so when these guys, Twitter and so forth, started building their applications, they had to do something new. Um, and you know, in a lot of cases, um, Google built Big Table, but in a lot of other cases, they did sharding. So they took MySQL and they took thousands of oh, tens of thousands of MySQL databases and put a layer on top of them to make them look like they were one logical data store. But they didn't have, you know, they lost everything in there, like SQL and transactions during that process and that was a sort of like a horrible compromise but it was necessary for you know the web to to be what it what it was but anyone working in engineering at that point was you know painfully aware of what an abomination a, a sort of like a large sharded database was so engineers being engineers they looked for alternatives and the first alternative that they came up with really was to say well what if we just forget about consistency for the moment um, and just focus on scalability and availability um, and as a result of that we had this sort of like the eventual consistency idea and we had what you know became sort of like tagged as no SQL databases like Cassandra where really you couldn't be very sure that it would be correct but you'd be sure that it came up and that it could respond and it could scale to global levels yeah. and then engineers went to heroic levels to write code on top of that that would deal with all the inconsistencies that would come up and i'm you know we're talking about really heroic levels i'm sure ben has plenty of sort of like memories of um, the sort of coding that's required when you're sort of like dealing with the database that you can't trust um yep. And then those decisions that were created for sort of like huge scales sort of like trickle down to database or applications that really had a sort of like a lower level of scale. It probably could have done with just a single MySQL database, but it became sort of like an article of faith to some extent that you needed sort of like a distributed database. That's not wrong. It's just most applications wouldn't scale that, that far. It would probably have gotten away with, you know, the relational databases of the day, but, you know, the the mind share was shifting in the other direction. Yeah. Um, I guess there's one other fact I'll just briefly mention, and that is that, you know, um, uh, DevOps and agile development really sort of like played a role here in, in the idea that we can, um, that schemaless um, allowed you to sort of like iterate faster. And you could, in particular, you could com commit some code. You didn't have to commit an alter table at the same time. You just write your, your, your change and it would, would percolate through. And that's still an issue today. But as I alluded to, you know, we've got the JSONB data type to if you need an extensible schema at the same time as you need a sort of like a, um, a fixed data model, then you've, you've got that with um, the JSONB data type. Sorry, yeah. I've sort of rambled on a bit there. But, um, you know, the, where we were in the 2015 when I wrote Next Generation Databases, and if you read it, the last chapter is essentially saying we're left with a plethora of choices, none of which are quite right for any application. And so we have to always choose something not quite right. And I was sort of like ended the book sort of hoping that there'd be a convergence of the sort of like the, the best of um, database engineering, you know, that I knew from the 80s, 90s, 2000s um, and the distributed um, database engineering that was sort of um, epitomied by things like Cassandra and so forth and essentially with distributed SQL databases like Cassandra we've, we've got that solution it was just I wrote the book one year too early to sort of notice yep. this. Yeah, and I think it's, it's been an interesting run you know there was this whole debate like I, I when I first got introduced to this whole like acid versus base you know so like the the two different types of database I think that's kind of what we're talking about a little bit here as well, Guy. And I think that was really interesting. You know, I mean, Ben, you were at Google. You kind of had a front row seat of some of this stuff, right? Were you around when kind of, I mean, they had Bigtable for a while and then they eventually built Spanner, right? It was, I mean, it was Dean and Gemawatt were kind of behind that, right? Were, were you kind of in the same area as that was going on? I and mean, were they dealing with the same things, Ben, at that time? Um, I was not. Uh, I was not working on uh, on Spanner or or Bigtable or any of the uh, any of the databases. Right. I was. I was on. The, I was on the user side. So working right. on Google Reader, we were we were using Bigtable. We were one of the but uh, one of the early adopters of of Bigtable as for an interactive application. Yeah. Um, and uh, and so, we, but we did get to see some interesting uh, interesting evolution there. Um, so as I said, uh, you know, for Reader, we had to build our own uh, pseudo transactional indexing system on top of Bigtable. Um, and this turned out to be a common enough problem that there was a team at Google that built uh, built a system called Megastore, which was a yep. uh, you know a, a general purpose uh, transactional implementation on top of uh, on top of Bigtable. 
Um, and that, that turned out to be very popular. Um, I think there were more, once that was, once that was built, there were more applications uh, using uh, Megastore on top of Bigtable than, uh, than just uh, Bigtable itself, at least as far as uh, interactive user-facing applications went. Um, but because Megastore was layered on top of, uh, of Bigtable, that, uh, it, I mean, the performance was not great. Um, there, there were just extra, extra layers on top. And so that influenced um, both uh, the Spanner team at Google, um, the Spanner next generation uh, system was being designed and built. They, uh, they made uh, transactions a first class consideration there. And, uh, and that also influenced uh, CockroachDB uh, to, make, uh, to make transactions uh, that fundamental to our, to our abstraction. Yeah, and it, you know, it's interesting, Ben, that, um, you know, I, I, I wish I could go back in time 15 years ago and look at what was going on at Google, honestly, because I feel like a lot of the innovation that happened in that kind of time frame, the, the time that you all were there, I mean, that mid 2000s till 2000, like, a lot of that innovation is now being used at mass in modern distributed systems. I that, that it's like, I, you know, the last company I worked at was CoreOS, our CEO used to call it Giphy. Google infrastructure for everyone else, which I kind of like, I've sensed the world is moving in that direction in many ways, right? So, I, you know, seeing those things happen and, and you know, the pains that they wanted to actually uh, address, it's, it's interesting, you know what I mean? So, but, but Cockroach is, it's, a, it's, it's not a version of Spanner, it's inspired by the Spanner white paper, right? I mean, that's, that's really kind of where you all got this. I mean, cause they do, I think Google does a great job of publishing white papers. If anybody ever wants like a PhD in distributed systems, go check out like the Google Scholar pages and look up Jeff Dean, Sanjay Gemiwat, um, Eric Brewer. There's a couple of engineers there that have done like amazing work. I mean, you all, Ben, like you, Spencer, Peter, you, you know, there's some really great stuff um, and some really great reading, um, but it's our job to make it simple. It's funny, the, uh, and so Mike Ferguson is on the call. Mike, I, you know, I, I know Mike from a long time ago. And when I was in the Hadoop space as well, and Mike has a very long question here. I can't ask the whole thing, Mike, but you know, one of the things here is like, you got to make the database really simple. So it just looks like a database for everybody. Now there's a lot of complexity in cockroach database, Ben. And you know, sometimes I remember when I first started, I had a hard time explaining these sort of things. You know, you've been around this thing for usual gosh, man, seven, almost eight years now. How do you explain cockroach database to people? Like, you know, you're at a cocktail party. Well, let's not use that because that's a wholly other thing. But like, how do you explain it to people? Yeah, so um, I mean, it depends on the audience. Um, I often talk about it the same way, uh, the same way Guy did um, in terms of being uh, kind of no compromises. Um, we take the, uh, the scalability of, uh, of non-SQL databases and the, uh, uh, with the, uh, the feature set and flexibility of, of SQL. Um, I think it, it, you know describing it as the as the best of both worlds is uh, is a pretty good uh, pretty good shorthand there. Um, another uh, another way I look at it is that uh, you, you know just like our, our namesake insect, the cockroach, um, which is said to be able to survive a, a nuclear explosion. Um, you, you know, cockroach makes um, cockroach TV makes takes things that would be disastrous in other uh, in other databases and turns them into non events. Yeah. So in a cockroach DB cluster, you can take, uh, you know, machine failures, uh, data center re regional failures, um, you know, things like that are just handled completely transparently with no uh, with no data loss. Um, and also other kinds of things that you don't necessarily think of as disasters, but like, you know, extreme uh, sudden success if you need to be able to scale up. Yeah. Uh, if you have a uh, if you have a, a, tr a traditional relational database, there's only so far you can go by, uh, by scaling up a single machine and you may have to introduce sharding, which if you need to retrofit sharding into an existing database, that can be an, an incredibly painful transition. Yeah. So you may find that if, you're, uh, if your application becomes too successful, then you have a, kind of, a, a different kind of disaster on your hands. Yeah. And so CockroachDB helps you, um, help, helps you uh, get scale and, and thrive even as, your, even as your traffic is going, uh, going through the roof. Um, as uh, you, you know, some of our customers have seen, um, you know, the last two years with the uh, with the pandemic have seen uh, tremendous shifts in uh, you, you know customer and user behavior, um, and so some of our uh, some of our biggest uh, biggest customers are uh, are companies that uh, that saw huge increases in their business, you know, as the pandemic uh, started shutting everything down and everyone started moving um, to, to uh, online activities. Yeah. It, it, you know, it's funny, Ben, I, I have basically abstracted everything we do at Cockroach Data, at Cockroach Labs, but it's all about scale. Like, yes, we're going to allow you to scale both elastic up and down, meet the needs of like bursts. I almost think as resilience and like this ability for high availability, it's a problem of scale. Like, do you have enough like instances? Do you have enough endpoints that things can answer? Do you have the data there? 
that it's kind of a question of scale. And then there's this kind of whole the geo replication of putting data all over the planet. That also is kind of geographic scale. Like I always come back to scale, dude, like it ever, over and over again. So I don't know, guide, like, you know, you, you were coming you know, okay. So Ben wrote the damn thing. You were coming in and, you know, <laughs> experiencing it. What was the, what were some of the things about cockroach database that were the most difficult for you to kind of get your head around and kind of grasp so that you can write about it guy. Cause there's some, some yeah, complexity yeah. here. Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, uh, I think it was, I think it's chapter, chapter two or chapter three is the architect chapter. And that was one of the yeah. chapters we wrote first. And that was hard because, um, you need an architect architecture chapter. Yeah, most people don't need to understand the internals of a system, but the book had to include one. And, um, yeah, I, I was I was really early on in my work with cockroach, so you know I had to I had to learn about all the smart things that um, Ben and his colleagues had done to to make it all work. And I've been familiar with some of these things from other database systems that I'd worked with, but there's a lot of you know um, really complex and sophisticated stuff in there. But then, and I don't want to sound like an advertisement for Cockroach DB because I don't work for your company, and you know I'm I'm supposedly an independent person, but I'm the author, one of the authors of the book, so I've yeah. some stake in it. Um, but then, what what really became you know interesting to me was once I'd written the architecture chapter and started going into the sort of application development and administration chapters. Most of the time, I never had to think about that stuff again. Um, you know, so things that are complicated on the inside don't have to be complicated on the outside. And if, as you've alluded to before, if the scaling just works um, and the command set for sort of managing it is relatively simple, then there's not that many scenarios in which you have to understand um, how the raft protocol works when you're dealing with, you know, setting up a multi-region cluster. The two, the two obviously raft is there as sort of like one of the building blocks, um, but you don't have to sort of like know that when you're sort of like deploying it. You just have to understand the concepts of a, 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 a sort of a multi-region deployment. Yeah. Um, you know, the rest of it, everything was um, fairly familiar. The, I was surprised how richly you'd um, implemented uh, the SQL language. You know, a lot of times you come to databases that have added or have got a SQL implementation, I'll say it's SQL 92. You know, a very, very old subset, but, um, you know, you had a very um, modern and comprehensive um, yes. set of commands. Um, and the, um, the tooling was mature. Um, and so it was really was a pleasure to work with. And, uh, you know, I started a new project this year, um, a side project, and, um, you know, I had to choose a database. And sure enough, I chose CockroachDB and um, created a serverless instance and um, haven't regretted that for a moment. It's been yeah, very... Yeah. Um, productive I, you know for me honestly guy it's kind of once you see it you can't unsee it some of the magic underneath the covers i love that you pointed out the architecture um chapter i remember i think i was at about a month and a half here at cockroach labs and i sat down with peter mattis one of the other founders and we had to build out um a deck that kind of talked about the architecture of cockroach and through that exercise i learned more about distributed systems and kind of how this thing works like the like to me i think the magic the magic moment in time for me ben was when i figured out like primary keys on tables and how they relate to ranges in the KV store and the translation of KV to SQL, it's magic. It's, it's, it's brilliant and it works, right? And I think it's, there's some really cool stuff there. And I think that that architecture chapter is very helpful. Honestly, Guy, I think it helps people understand the database. It helps them understand ranges. It helps that, you know, I think one of our most popular blog posts is how to choose a primary key for a table in CockroachDB. And Ben, yeah. you, you, I think you help write that one, Ben, right? Like that, that, mm -hmm. that post is great and it's super important, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. Um, you know, choosing your choosing your keys is very important in any database. Um, I do want to say, um, you, you know, this magic that you're talking about of translating, uh, you, you know, keys into uh, into strings um, and the translation down into the uh, mm -hmm. into the the key value, the underlying key value layer. That, that's certainly not unique to Cockroach. This is something that uh, you know, MySQL and SQLite uh, both do. Um, our encoding here is actually modeled on the SQLite encoding. So right. this is something that. Uh, you know, part, parts of this apply even to um, even to very non-distributed uh, databases like SQLite. Um, yeah. But it's still a, uh, a fundamental thing that you have to keep in mind. And in a distributed system like CockroachDB, it takes on even more importance because the cost of uh, the cost of getting this wrong is uh, is much higher because you're talking about you know not just going off to uh, you know doing more disk seeks, you're doing uh, potentially more uh, network round trips off to other nodes in the system. And so you have to, um, you know, care about balancing, um, 
your, your primary key to spread data across uh, across different nodes, um, get to, trying to keep a, a balance between keeping data that's going to be used together in the same place and keeping data that's going to be used independently in different yeah. places so that you can um, maximize the parallelism that you're able to get from your hardware resources. Yeah, and it's it's that the storage layer is really the I think that's what really it, it started to make a whole lot of sense for me. Ben, honestly, when I got there. Um, and there's a lot of magic that we can do around kind of multi-region, right? And spreading data into different places or tying data to a location you know, we call geo-partitioning, right? Was, was the concept of multi-region and geo-partitioning, the, these kind of fairly complex and unique concepts, were they part of Cockroach from the very beginning as well? Um, not really. Um, I think we started at, like, it was always kind of in the back of our mind um, that this would be something that would be, uh, that would be feasible. Yeah. Um, but it was... Uh, it, it was really more of kind of, uh, you know, in the beginning, it was like, well, let's let's focus on uh, on single region. This is an area that we may be able to explore later. Um, it was uh, it was not really um, a fundamental uh, fun fundamental goal from the beginning to get things into uh, into global uh, global configurations. We we really um, were focused on um, on solving um, get, you know smaller smaller scale uh, problems. Um, get, you know, dealing with uh, with scale within uh, within a, a region and not adding uh, adding additional um, regional latency to yeah. the mix at, in the beginning. And Ben, there's a lot of value in a single region for cockroach, yeah. right? I mean, we, we talk about this a lot, right? Can you just talk about that really quickly? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, you know, like I said, we, the, the original impetus for cockroach DB was not about uh, about global uh, reach at all. It was right. about, um, you know, scalability within one, one region. But even more than that, it was about, um, like I said, having the, having the database take care of the data for you. Um, I think uh, one of the reasons that uh, one of the reasons that Spencer started, uh, you, you know, writing out the first uh, the first version of the uh, of the CockroachDB design doc is that if you look at what it takes to set up a set, setting up a single uh, a single uh, Postgres virtual machine is fine that that's easy, um, but it, if you want to set up uh, a pair of replicated uh, Postgres machines, you know that's that's suddenly a lot uh, a lot more work, um, and that's. And uh, and I think one of the reasons that Spencer started writing down the, the cockroach de uh, design was uh, was because he, he was you know trying to trying to procrastinate and not have to deal with that of setting up uh, you know these kinds of basic operations on day one, and so that's why with uh, with cockroach DB you get um, you know you get replication built in. It's not something that's yep. uh, that's extra complexity that you have to add on after you get your uh, your, your you know your first uh, toy uh, demo running. It's just there from uh, from day one. Um, yeah. And then we have we have other things that are that are valuable from uh, from the beginning, like uh, like our non-blocking schema changes, um, you, you know, just th these things that are uh, that, that are sources of extra operational complexity in other databases. Um, they're absolutely necessary at scale because you can't uh, because you can't lock down a table uh, long enough to be able to run a, uh, a you know run, run a schema change on on terabytes of data. But they're useful even at even at small scale because it means you don't yeah. need to take uh, take your uh, cluster offline for the, for these kinds of routine operations. Yeah. I mean, just think about like rolling upgrades, online schema changes, like the, it's, it's funny. It's like, you know, planned and unplanned downtime. And I remember I was talking to uh, one of our customers about this and it's like, man, it's not the stuff that happens at three in the morning. It's the problems that happen in the middle of the day that are problem. You know what I mean? Like, mm -hmm. and so being able to just kind of architect that out by using a database that's just going to be resilient to that. I mean, it is the cockroach, right? I mean, yeah. hence the name, right? And it was, that's a big deal. Yeah, and I, I think that's you, you know we're, we're reacting in part to the the trends in the uh, in the industry. You know, right. I've, I've worked at companies that would go um, would go years in between database upgrades because that was such a painful operation. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you, you know, look at the way uh, the way browsers have uh, have evolved. You know, we used to get uh, you know new versions of uh, new versions of browsers every uh, every year or two, and now they're coming out every six weeks. Auto updates pushed to the entire world. Um, you know, and uh, and more software should be like that because that's how things evolve and, and get better. And so, you, you know, we knew that uh, that any new database was going to have to go through many iterations to get to uh, to, to get to something that's really uh, really good. And so, we wanted to make uh, and so so that was that was a priority from the beginning to be able to upgrade without uh, without downtime. Yeah, and and you know this this concept of like automatically delivering updates, Ben, and doing things while they're in production, it's a huge thing to me. Like that's how you secure the internet. Like, cause I, you, you have to like, imagine with a guy, I mean, you, you've probably been through this before, but like, you know, upgrade a database every year, you're asking for problems, right? Or every two, like 
doing this in real time, it's uh, such a big deal, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, Ben's quite right. You know, like I worked for a lot of companies where, you know, a database upgrade was sort of like, a, it's yeah. the stuff of nightmares. Um, and you'd be doing it, you know, in the middle of the night because, you know, you, 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 was, you were unable to avoid um, an outage during it. And um, you'd have a lot of sort of like contingency for sort of rolling back. And as a result, you wouldn't, you wouldn't do it very often. And so right. databases went unpatched and so forth. And that led to a lot of security holes. And, it's um, still, and it still I, I, happens. It's still going on, guys. Like, I, you know, there's systems that are offline for three hours. I wonder what they're doing. And usually I just say uh, they're probably upgrading a database. You know what I mean? Like, mm-hmm. yeah, we, we, we do actually have, uh, have one customer who recently, uh, recently told me that, that they used to have a policy of doing database, uh, you know, doing database changes in the middle of the night. And yeah. they said that, you know, since they moved to Cockroach, that they've, uh, that they've gotten rid of that policy. And now they, now they do their database changes uh, during the day when people are, when people are awake. Yeah, because they're they're safe enough to do, uh, you know, while while you're getting live traffic. Yeah, well, I mean, I think the you know the big thing that changed between now and then is that we we used not to have database clusters, so there'd be one monolithic database, and it really wasn't really possible to upgrade it while it stayed up the entire yep. time. At some point, it would have to it would have to bounce, and you know. You know, sometimes those bounces, you know, as it came back up, it would start to migrate its schema or whatever, and um, that could take hours. But now with rolling upgrades on, you know, not just CockroachDB, but on most um, multi-node, you know, m- masterless systems, it's 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 a lot easier. And, and but, most- you know... The- go on, Guy, please. Go on. No, I was going to say, but, you know, the, the ultimate experience that, that people, I think, are, are going to migrate to because it's just so superior for, for most cases is... Um, a cloud-based database where um, the upgrade happens and you're barely aware of it. I mean, you have to sign off on it, but um, you don't do anything, you know, like you just get an email and says, you know, we're, unless you do something to stop us, we're going to upgrade, you know, at some point over the next couple of weeks and, and it happens. And um, and that's the browser experience, right? You don't, you don't sort of like opt out of that's browser right. upgrades generally because they don't, they don't go wrong, you know. Now, you know, someone might make a mistake Let's hope not. But but generally, that's what we're aspiring to, right? We're aspiring to, you know, software sort of like continuously upgrading itself and you not having to sort of like worry too much about that process at every le- le- every layer of the stack. And I think it's a big deal, Guy. We live in a different world than it was even five years ago. You know, we have a large financial services company, a big bank, you know, and they repave servers. They basically, every couple of months, they take an entire server and they just reflash the entire thing from the ground up, from the operating system all the way up. Because they basically need like, you know, these sort of kind of like secure instances of everything that they have, right? And I think that's a big deal. And we can do that today. That's the beauty of it. I think that's, we're living in a different world. And, you know, we talk about ease. We talk about kind of, you know, sim- you know the simplicity of basically putting operations in the background. You know, Guy, you mentioned um, you're using uh, the serverless version of Cockroach Database as well, right? Um, what's been your experience on that? And like, what, you know, is is it just Postgres? I mean, basically like, are you frustrated that you can't do certain things or like, is this kind of what you think the future is going to look like? <laughs> um, I, no, I absolutely think that um, especially for, for, for the vast majority of applications, um, some form of a serverless database um, will be the preferred way. Um, developers want to get started quickly. They don't want to muck around too much. They don't want to have sort of like a large planning session before they, they can start. Yep. moving and serverless delivers that in the same sort of way that quick download and go of mysql in the past um would do that um but it it you, if you've got a serverless instance um you can have some trust that um you're not going to run out of capacity um you know at least you know not in your first couple of years you know you might find that at some point serverless Um, And I'm not talking about serverless just in the context of Cockroach, but the general model of serverless, which is sort of like a co-tenanted database in in a way that, um, but it it, it will grow with you without you having to worry too much about it. You just need to worry about your your spend rather than your, um, rather than sort of like engineering as sort of an upgrade. And um, that's that's the way it should be, you know. Like all all application developers really want to focus on the the value that they're adding to their customers, not focusing their time and energy on um, maintaining infrastructure. Um, so you know, and that's you know, Kubernetes and other sort of like breakthroughs that we've had over the past sort of ten years and continuously, you know, like help us 
focus more and more effort on our value add and less and less effort on the infrastructure. And I think serverless is a perfect example of that. Yeah, I'm completely intrigued by the serverless model now. Honestly, you guys, like I was not a total believer in it, but the more and more I've learned about kind of how and why it, it, it starts to make a whole lot of sense. And I, I see it happening across a lot of different pieces. A lot of ISVs kind of taking the serverless principles and applying it to their stack uh, so that they can actually, you know, I think it's about consumption based. I think it's about, I don't think people want huge bills to the public cloud provider. So how do you make it so that it, you, know, you pay for what you use, right? And I think that's what people really want. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's a big driver behind this whole thing. But I, Ben, I'm, 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 I'm so happy I get to ask you this question because I've been dying to ask you this one. But like, so serverless is directionally kind of some of the stuff that we're doing here at Cockroach. You know, you know, we're single region right now. We'll be, you know, multi region in the fallish range, right? Like we're we're moving in a direction where you know, kind of this this thing goes. Where does this database go three years, five years from now? Like, where where do you think? Not not just cockroach, but I guess in general. I mean, your your context is is cockroach database, but you know, what is the future of the database? Say five years out, something like that. Yeah. So the the, the trend that I think about in this area is. Uh, is you know when I when I started my career you know JavaScript wasn't really a thing you would have a kind of a, a two tier application structure you'd have right. an application that uh, generated that you know that talked to a database on the back end and then um, and then spit out the HTML to be uh, to be rendered by the browser and then uh, you, you know JavaScript came along and you started to have these three tiers you have the JavaScript and then the uh, the application server and then the JavaScript on the front end and what we've seen since then is really kind of a hollowing out of that uh, of that middle tier. Um, with uh, much of that functionality being uh, being uh, kind of lifted up into the into the, the front end in the uh, in the JavaScript, and uh, and I think that what we're uh, you know what, what we're going to see on the on the other side is uh, I think um, you know the, the, uh, the and that that's the moving moving functionality away from the database was a, was a trend in the uh, in the nineties um, when uh, when stored procedures were kind of falling out of fashion. Yeah. And that was coming about because the database was the hardest thing in your stack to scale. So you wanted to get as much load off of the database as you, as you could, um, in order to uh, in order to you know get, stretch it as far as you could before you uh, before you hit that scalability wall. Um, but now that we have uh, we have really scalable databases and uh, and especially um, uh, uh, databases that can be scaled on kind of a serverless and consumption based uh, based model. You know that argument for pulling functionality out of the database is really going away, and so I think we're going to see, um, you know, a continuation of the trend of hollowing out the middle tier of the uh, of the application stack um, in the other direction, with uh, more and more capabilities being uh, being shifted down into the database. Um, and so I think uh, I think you could see uh, could see a world in the future where you get um, your your, uh, your uh, front end, whether it is uh, you know JavaScript in the browser or a, a mobile app or whatever. Talking uh, much more directly to the database than uh, than they do today, because there's uh, there's not really a need for a, uh, a heavyweight layer in in front in in, the, in between the the uh, front end and the application. You know, I think we can build um, all the. I mean, there's you know, there's performance and isolation and uh, security and all all those things. But all these all these capabilities are things that databases need anyway. And so the, these things are going to be built into uh, built into the database, and then it becomes you know something that's not. You know, it's it's not crazy to think about uh, a, a mobile application sending, uh, you know, communicating directly with the database in in the future. Yeah, it's almost like we return back to this kind of almost client server, but it's distributed server. Like you know, it, it's you know, it's that it's the two tiers, but you have this distributed system in the background now, Ben. I I'm a believer in it. I really am, and I and I think the tech is almost here to do it. Like we're 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 just at the precipice of something like that happening. So. Um, Guy, what do you think the database looks like in say the next three years, five years? Uh, well, I think we're um, having seen it all split apart and come back together. I think the convergence trend is going to be the one that um, the battle that everyone will be on. Like, so everyone that doesn't have a JSON support will add JSON support, and everyone who doesn't have a SQL support will add SQL support. And that's what you see if you look at. Yeah. So if you look at what MongoDB is doing, for instance, they're sort of like pushing as much back into the box that they took out. You know, I'm not yep. criticizing here, but it's just an obvious thing for them to do better SQL support transactions and so forth. 
Um, so there'll be a sort of like a, a bit of a convergence on a functionality level. As I said, I think serverless um, and cloud-based, we, we're well past the, the tipping point for cloud-based databases. They make a lot of economic sense. Um, and, uh, you know, even a cloud-based database where you're paying for idle time still makes sense if you, if you can avoid paying DPA costs and other human costs involved in running your own database. But with serverless, it's just absolutely resistible financially, unless you've got some really, really powerful need to run it on your own data centre, in which case I think um, we're not quite there where the experience inside the data centre matches the experience um, that you get from serverless. Um, you know, Kubernetes is, um, is, is obviously the platform for sort of creating private cloud type experiences, but um, I, I like to think that we'll see it get mature to the point at which you can have essentially serverless type resource consumption from a cockroach DB instance or, or other database yeah. instances running inside internal clouds running Kubernetes. And I honestly think that's enough to aspire to in the next sort of three or three to five years. I don't think, I don't, I don't expect another big database revolution. Um, that having been said, I didn't expect the last one. Really, it looked like relational and sort of bedded in for good, but. Um, you know, if you look closely, the, the, the fault lines were there. Um, I, you know, I, I think our digital experience is going to be similar in five years from now. I don't think we're going to have something as revolutionary as mobile phones or Web 2.0, but yeah. you know, been wrong before, ready to be wrong again. Yeah. Well, I, just, I, I, I imagine a world where there's just get and puts and there are SQL queries that are behind those things. And, you know, it's some connection string in the sky. And it's like this SQL API that you're just dealing with and nobody has to deal with the database. The database becomes like a data service that you kind of do all these things. And I, we're not that far away from that. I, I think we're, we're heading that direction. So, so final topic, guys, I do have to get beyond this and just, you know, I, the title of this thing was to talk about a book. We heard, we didn't even talk about a book, you guys. So um, just like, just to, I know we have to drop it just the top of the hour. We're going to have to actually cut this one right at the top of the hour, but like, I don't know, guys, I, I Guy, you're coming new to this stuff. I'll start with you. What was the biggest challenge with this book in particular? You've written other books, right? And so with this definitive guide, what, what was the biggest challenge with it? Uh, well, for me, usually when I'm writing a book, I'm kind of the expert on the book team. I'm usually the only person on the book team, you know, yeah. I'm the sole author. Um, but I'm bringing my expertise or, or I, I'm still learning something. But, you know, I'm coming with it without sort of like... Um, uh, other experts on the team. <clears throat> so this was a bit of a different role for me. Um, and actually, I think it worked out fine. Um, you know, I learned a huge amount about CockroachDB during the process, which is one of the reasons I took on the task because I, I did really want to dive deep and this gave me the impetus to do it. Um, but I think having someone who was uh, experienced in databases, but not necessarily that experience with CockroachDB was a good thing because yep. as um, Ben and Jesse funneled through the sort of content through me, I had to understand and then express what I'd learned. And there's nothing to, to ex having something explained to you by someone who's just grasped it is a good experience. When you've known something for five years, sometimes you just can't explain it. There's too many hidden assumptions in what you, what you know. Um, and then you realize you've got to go back, you know, sort of like five years of your experience and explain, you know, I don't know, raft or whatever, but, yeah. so, you know, other things that you thought everyone knew, but it turns out, you know, they don't. So I think that made the book a good book, uh, accessible. Um, at least I hope it did. Well, uh, I got to tell you, I was I was like overjoyed that you ended up being the author because you have this like deep experience in the traditional relational database. I know, Ben, you do as well, but you've been living in this distributed systems world for so long that like the combination of the two, I think, was right. Because, yep. you know, yep. being able Thanks. to translate these advanced topics and using the root of basically the traditional world that we all live in. Sometimes here at Cockroach, as we get in these conversations, we forget that there's a world of like old legacy databases, right? Like it's so like, and, and it's funny, um, you know, I think some people just live in this new world. So I, I you know, I, I think it was a phenomenal kind of mix of a set of people guy. I, I, like I said, I was pretty, pretty, pretty excited about that. So yeah. Uh, well, and, and for that matter, O'Reilly bring a lot to yeah. um, the process. Uh, I've worked with a lot of publishers. O'Reilly take a lot of care to make sure that the quality is high and um, they sort of look over your shoulder. And um, yeah. uh, that's why O'Reilly books are sort of generally, you know, the most highly regarded. 
So I guess last question, um, cause we do have to drop at the top of the hour. And by the way, everybody, um, I know we're going to give away books to people. I, I forget what JP, if you want to just put the details on how we're doing that into the chat, that'd be really wonderful. I'm sorry, dude. I don't want to get it wrong. You know what I mean? So like, if you just want to do that, that'd be awesome. I think we're giving away books to uh, people who are actually on the session. So you can get a definitive guide. Um, Ben, have you ever written a book before? No. So would you ever do it again? Um, probably not. I'll stick to writing software. Wise <laughs> oh, man. I mean, I think you, I think I had a conversation with you once. It was like I was talking to you about Raft, and you were, I think you said something like, "Yeah, Raft seems simple, but doing it in production for a production database is really quite difficult, right?" Like, mm -hmm. yeah, and, and code is really difficult. Words are pretty difficult too, though, dude. I'm just saying. Yeah. So. Well, cool. Um, yeah. So as JP wrote in the, in the, in the chat, y'all, we're going to give away 50 physical copies to people who actually attended this. Um, thank you everybody for joining today. I, I hope this was uh, somewhat what you expected. Uh, you know, Ben, Guy and I had a, had a good time kind of coming together and figuring out what we were going to talk about. Um, but I do like these things to be as, as useful and as valuable as possible. We, we covered a lot, right? We, lots of different things here. Um, but Ben, thank you for everything um, and, and being on this today. Uh, it's always a pleasure to, to spend time with you. Thank you, buddy. And uh, Guy, as always, uh, you know, thank you for dialing in. Y'all, if you don't know, Guy actually lives uh, on the, in another hemisphere than, than where I am. Uh, and it's winter and it's morning for you, right? Yep, it's just, um, we're just coming up to 7 a.m. for me. So. <laughs> well, 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 Thanks for a, getting me started on my day. <laughs> that's great. It's tomorrow for you. So listen, have a that's great day, sure, Guy. Yeah. You're just starting tomorrow. So uh, we're, we're kind of coming up towards the end of it here. So uh, ben, thank you for, for everything. Guy, thanks for having it. Everybody, thank you for joining. Thank Jim. you, Jim. Thanks for all your help.